Let's explore the four immeasurables and then meditate. This is Lama Jigme Gyatso of the Buddha Joy Meditation School. Welcome to Meditate Like a Jedi. This is the Lama you are looking for. This evening, we could chant and meditate and enjoy a lesson or two, but first, if you love Star Wars and you wish to meditate as transformatively as Obi-Wan Kenobi upon the toasty sands of Tatooine, be sure to subscribe and ring that notification bell. If at any point during this evening you have a question about Buddhist meditation or Buddhist philosophy or how to apply them to the particulars of your life, do not be bashful. Simply type your question in great detail in the chat window on the right-hand side of the screen. Do that immediately. Don't wait till the end of the live stream. So by, when we practice the four immeasurables, that would fit under the heading of right view and right intentions, first and second folds of the eightfold path. By the way, side note, I love how imperious kitty cats are. And if anybody's arms seem to be shaped like as if they were going to cradle something, then that cat thinks, you know, that's the place for me. I just love that. Talking about this individual right here. Now, there are many translations and many, um, there are many translations of the four immeasurables and in different sequences. I have chosen uh, this particular sequence um, because it does an excellent job of illustrating various facets of the Buddhist path. Consider, if you will, the three mental poisons. In the Mahayana tradition, we typically, well, in the earliest point in the Mahayana tradition, it was taught of as being uh, hate, uh, hating, craving, and clinging. Uh, after some time, it became Clinging was replaced with confusion. So let us now explore the four measurables in light of the three mental poisons. May everyone be free from stress. Well, what do we hate? What do we shove away? Stressors. Things that cause us emotional pain, or physical pain, or uh, and social pain, or circumstantial duress. We hate them. We want to push them away. So by wishing that everyone be free from stressors, we are undermining the very causes, the very triggers of each being's hate. May everyone be happy. Of course, I have a strange relationship with the word happy. Many years ago, goodness, close to 30 years ago, I, <laughs> me and my former wife uh, celebrated our honeymoon at Disneyland. And they call it the happiest place on earth. But as the day wears on, you can hear, you can hear the din of crying children fills the air. That does not sound like the happiest place on earth to me. <laughs> we wish every, that may everyone be happy. And if we got our wish, one of the things that would happen is that happiness, well, we, we desire happiness. We reach for happiness. We um, crave happiness. But if happiness is already there, if everything in our life that we think will make us happy and that will actually make us happy are present in our life, 
then there are no craving triggers. We come now to the third mental poison. May, may no one be separated from their happiness. Um, <laughs> in one of the many uh, televised versions of Pride and Prejudice, <laughs> Elizabeth Bennet's mom, the queen, uh, the princess of pettiness herself, said, Oh, they seem to be very happy. I only hope it'll last. And by her body language and her facial expression, you could tell she was emoting the opposite. <laughs> but all of us, when we get what we want, there is a tremendous fear of losing what we now have. Um, in fact, psychologists have, for decades have insisted that humans will work harder to keep from losing what they have than to gain what they want. So this is a primal drive. And if everyone was, was never separated from what they love, from what they have, then no one would, be exper would experience the trigger for clinging. Now, let's take a deeper look at these three mental poisons. Contrary to popular belief, they do not arise from the belief of a self. These are primal, uh, is part of, I guess, primal survival drives. Uh, these evolved basically just because of DNA. DNA is a harsh master and it wants to spread. And it spreads through copulating life forms. <laughs> Dead life forms can't copulate. I know. I've looked into it. It doesn't happen. Night of the Bonking Dead. <laughs> no one wants to see that. So, we are primary serve reward system or most ancient reward system is dopamine oriented and it drives us to um, do everything that is required to uh, um, reproduce and rear young and it doesn't care if we're exhausted or miserable or have shattered our relationships all it cares about is broadening and deepening the gene pool so what gets us in trouble is not the presence of these three mental poisons but their tyranny which brings us to the fourth immeasurable may everyone have balance from the tyranny of hating, craving, and clinging, at last freed. And so it could be argued that these first three immeasurables are about just our conventional needs. And the fourth immeasurable is adjusting our ultimate need for liberation, not from the, not the presence of the three mental poisons, but from their tyranny. That is the liberation that the Buddha offers. Now you might say, well, what about enlightenment? What if enlightenment was nothing more than mastery of the Buddha's eightfold path? Before we start, before we chant and then meditate, let's take one minute for housekeeping. Every day I live stream four meditation classes without any advertisements or product endorsements, health permitting. If you find value in my explanations and techniques and group practice and free downloadables and um, my enthusiasm to answer the questions that you type in the chat window, then allow me to remind you that with your assistance, this channel could help support the next generation 
of nuns, monks, yogis, lamas, and even brick-and-mortar meditation centers, each replete with a resident teacher and their apprentice. If this speaks to you and you'd like to help out, even for as little as the cost of one cup of coffee a month, just use your smartphone's camera to capture this QR code. Or if you're old school, simply click one of the donation links in the description area below the video. So, the common theme in this practice text is shortcuts, finding shortcuts. The first two folds of the Eightfold Path are contemplations of the wisdom of letting go and contemplations of wishing love. The two easiest ways to train in that is by, res is by res re chanting the Four Immeasurables and chanting the Heart of Wisdom Sutra. And so that is exactly what we're going to do. It's sort of like the Oreo cookie between uh, bookending the icing that is our enthusiastic practice of meditation. They might say, hey, what, that, what, wait one minute, that's only five. You're missing three other folds of the eightfold path. And the answer is yes, yes I am. Those, are, those would be kind communication, kind conduct, and kind commerce. Because no one wants to be a Chad or Karen. Okay, together let's chant and let's chant um, percussively using a golf clap at about the level of our solar plex or our diaphragm. The Bodhisattva while practicing the deep practice of Prajnaparamita looked upon the five skandhas and seeing they were empty of self-existence. And yes, if any of you find any of this puzzling, Simply type your question in the chat window. Said here, Shari Putra, form is emptiness, emptiness is form. Emptiness is not separate from form, form is not separate from emptiness. Whatever is form is emptiness, whatever is emptiness is form. The same holds for sensation and perception, memory and consciousness. Here Shariputra, all dharmas are defined by emptiness, not by birth or destruction, purity or defilement, completeness or deficiency. Therefore, Shariputra, in emptiness there is no form, no sensation, no perception, no memory, and no consciousness. No eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, and no mind. No shape, no sound, no smell, no taste, no feelings, and no thought. No eye, and... Sorry. No element of perceptions from my to conceptual consciousness. No causal link from consciousness to old age and death. No end of causal link from consciousness to old age and death. No suffering, no source, no relief, no path. No knowledge, no attainment, and no non-attainment. Therefore, Shariputra, without attainment, Bodhisattvas take refuge in Prajnaparamita and live without the wall of the mind. 
Without walls of the mind and thus without fears, they see through delusions and finally accomplish nirvana. O Buddhas, past, present, and future, also take refuge in Prajna Paramita and realize an excel perfect enlightenment. You should therefore know the great mantra of Prajna Paramita, the mantra of great magic, the unexcelled mantra. The mantra equal to the unequaled, which heals all suffering and is true, not false. The mantra in Prajna Paramita is spoken thus. Gate gate para gate para san gate bodhiswaha. So now let's apply the Prajnaparamita mantra through the cunning use of rhetorical question. Generically, as we breathe in, we could silently and mentally ask how relax into the awareness of this. And then we can physically relax into the chanted recitation of this 17-syllable mantra. But wait, what about this bit right here? Glad you asked. If you have something specific going, in your li going on in your life right now, um, you can label it and put it in right here if you feel that you need to label it. God hang on him on hang on him on as on God in Buddhist war. God hang on him on hang on him on as on God in Buddhist war. God hang on him on hang on him on as on God in Buddhist war. God hang on him on hang on him on as on God in Buddhist war. God he got him on a god he but as on god he but is God he got him but a god he but as on god he but is God he got him but a god he but as on god he but is God he got him but a god he but as on god he but is God he got him on a god he but as on god he but is God he got him on a god he but as on god he but is God he got him on a god he but as on god he but is God he got him on a god he but as on god he but is God he got him but a god he but as on god he but is God he got him but a god he but as on god he but is God he got him but a god he but as on god he but is God he got him but a god he but as on god he but is There's this myth that what we're, by the way, if you just joined in, welcome. When you have a question, simply type it in great detail in the chat window. There is this myth that what we're supposed to do is not think of anything ever. Just stomp it out under the heel of our boot. But that's not really what the Buddha taught. Sometimes we're in a mellow state, our mind's passive, and we can just meditate. Other times we are very, our mind's very active. And so... We, that's not a flaw, that's a feature. We can harness the activity of our mind through the cunning use of, uh, rhetorical, of, of rhetorical use of uh, act of contemplating rhetorical questions. Look, there's four right here. Now, clearly the third one, the second one is not a rhetorical question, it's a compassionate intention. But we can play with these when our mind feels active and we can just be mellow when our mind feels passive.
But wait a second, how's about a bit of a deeper explanation? Interesting spelling. Okay. What is the key? What's the easiest and most effective form of Sutra Mahamudra? Glad you asked. Physically oriented, the physically oriented metaphoric practice of Soto Zen's just sitting. What is the key to sitting up night, sitting straight and tall in a manner that'll make your grandma proud? During each inhalation, use the uh, Use the diaphragmatic breathing to, as the engine that drives our tall sitting posture. Now, during each inhalation, we can practice mindfulness as easily as, as we silently and mentally recite, feeling this. And we can meditate and during each exhalation, we can meditate as silently and mentally we recite, relaxing. It's 21 minutes after the hour. Let's meditate in just a second. Now, we don't get extra points for suffering. So get off the cross, so many needs the wood. Sit comfortably. You don't want to be all... Asymmetric. You want equidistant between each shoulder and its ear. And you don't want to be twisted. You want that nose to be in line with your navel. So real quick, let's lean one way. Let's lean the other way. Hands in your lap, palm up. And, this, and for one round of breath, let's breathe with just in an insane degree of enthusiasm. We evolved in such a way that during each in-breath, we access our sympathetic nervous system, which is wired for sensory acuity, not concentration, but allowing us to notice vulnerably, passively, viscerally, and randomly. Notice what you might ask? Sights, sounds, sensations, flavors, scents, and the like as well as emotion, intention, thought, memory, and imagination. Some will be 
pleasurable, some will be painful, some will be interesting, some will be boring, some of what we perceive will be glorious, and others will be a, a bit grotesque. Our job is not to pretend we're the director of the play or the author, but simply an audience member here to enjoy the show. For with every exhalation, we access our parasympathetic nervous system, which has evolved for both physical relaxation and mental release. The great South Indian Buddhist philosopher Nagarjuna spoke of the two truths. It is during our inhalation we perceive the conventional, and during our exhalation that we relax into the non graspability of the ultimate. Or to paraphrase our friend Morpheus from The Matrix, welcome to the eternity of the now.
how do we transcend the dualities? The dualities of the physical, the external or the internal, the physical or the mental, the pleasurable or the painful, the interesting or the boring, the glorious or the grotesque? Simple. We open ourselves up to whatever the present moment experiences with each inhalation. And during each exhalation, we relax into that experiences non-graspable nature. When we do that, it feels Whatever we experienced during the previous inhalation can now feel as if it was as non-graspable as a vast, empty void. It is that experience of non-graspability is, that is the common denominator that, un, that unifies all experiences, like the strong thread upon, wrist, upon which rests the 108 beads of Amala. Each bead might be a little bit different, but they are unified in their relationship to that piece of string. Similarly, each experience, each perception, each inhalation's perception could be you know, a distinct little snowflake. Yet, their watery nature is what unifies them. The quickest way to exacerbate our stressors is to resist them. Just as Elon Musk would say that when it comes to building a rocket, the lightest part is no part. Similarly, if you do not wish to be a target, then don't be there. Just cease to resist. And then we will be like a great big fluffy cumulus cloud. One of my teachers was described by the press as being a cross between a bulldozer and a fluffy cloud.
let's see Lord practice with well let's first let us perform some meta meditations let us wish profound love for all minds and now great kindness for all speech. Let us wish great kindness for all conduct. Let us wish kindness for all commerce. May everyone be free from stress, may everyone be happy, may no one be separated from the happiness, may everyone have balance from the tyranny of hating, craving, and clinging free. May everyone be free from stress, may everyone be happy, may no one be separated from the happiness. May everyone have balance from the tyranny of hate and craving and clinging freed. May everyone be free from stress, may everyone be happy. May no one be separated from the happiness. May everyone have balance from the tyranny of hate and craving and clinging freed. If you feel I have earned it, type something in the chat window. Give this live stream a thumbs up and share it on social media. In approximately 10 and two thirds hours, I would very much like to return to lead tomorrow's early morning meditation. And if you are as geeky as me, this is the way.